In the mid-2000s, a certain game company was criticized for its unoriginality and poor handling of the properties under its umbrella. The company seemed to prioritize annual sports games over new ideas and presented itself as money grubby, barely interested in improving the industry it was a part of. Now, if that sounds familiar to a certain company today, that's because, get this, it's the same company. In a time where they got under a bit of hot water because of how they conducted business, EA became more receptive to new IP that may not have been the conventional, reliable money makers they'd prioritized in the past, and led to some really amazing, classic games like Dead Space, Mass Effect, Crisis, and Hasbro's Family Game Night 2, which is unironically the one from that list which I spent the most time with. It couldn't all last though, or I guess I should say it definitely could have lasted, but money. EA seemingly sabotaged the Dead Space series, demanding more action elements and microtransactions be added to boost revenue despite the developer's wishes, and while some question when and why exactly Bioware started its dive bomb into the sun, it certainly seemed as though a major factor was EA, absolutely demolishing the house that Bioware built. The poor decisions and return to EA's misgivings of the past seem to have come to a peak in recent years once again, with the disdain for the company among consumers increasing drastically following the mishandling of the Battlefront and Battlefield series, the sports games getting even more repetitive and even less iterative, and really completing the fiery slam at the end of that Bioware dive bomb with Anthem. And faced with a similar problem, it feels like EA has returned to a similar solution, introducing a bevy of promising single player titles back into their roster to appease its audience. Although this time around, while they have allowed for some new series to pop up like Respawn's Jedi games and have done a really genuine great job with a program like EA Originals, it seems like the plan isn't to introduce new IPs, but to bring back some of the more beloved franchises that were created in the company's first redemption arc, ones that achieved either smash hit or cult classic status. A Dead Space remake is set to release early next year, we've seen the launch of the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, followed by an announcement of a new Mass Effect and a new Dragon Age coming out of Bioware, with seemingly a refocus on what made that company great to begin with, and we've even heard from Crytek that a new Crisis game is in early development. Basically what I'm saying is, it's the mid-2000s again, baby! Look, it's Kanye in a pink polo rapping along to You Belong With Me by Taylor Swift prior to the 2009 VMAs. Life is good, man! Life is good. What's missing from that list, though, is the game that I would personally most love to see come back, not only as a response to EA's recent failings, but also the failings of DICE, the company most known for creating Battlefield and, more recently, ruining Battlefield. But not to be too one-dimensional, they also tried their hands in ruining Battlefront as well, so way to shake things up, boys. It feels like DICE needs a bit of a refresh at this point, maybe a change of pace before they can reinvigorate either of those franchises in question, preferably a change of pace void of anything battle-related. And while we don't know how long this EA reform is gonna last, cause god knows historically this has been a blip on the radar, that blip was concentrated quality, so I hope it's seen as an opportunity for DICE to bring back Mirror's Edge. I didn't play Mirror's Edge when it first came out, and it took me a long time to actually get to it. How long exactly? Um, I played it for the first time last week. But despite being so late to the party, I gotta say this game really gripped me. It was meant to be a wind down game between me also playing, let's see here, uh, Getsufumidin, Tunic, and Sekiro again, so I had my plate full already, but the original Mirror's Edge wound up capturing my attention and I blazed through it in a day's time. I was worried with the game being almost 15 years old now that I'd simply missed the time frame to really enjoy this title, but I was pleasantly surprised with what I got. That's not to say it's perfect though, I have plenty of complaints that did negatively affect my experience which I'll also discuss here, but the original Mirror's Edge especially felt like a diamond coated in coal. If you chipped away at some of its issues and brought it up to modern standards, there's something truly special that the series can still offer. And while Catalyst kind of loses the original's charm, it does show that the actual feel of the series' parkour elements was trending upwards. On top of that, games like Ghost Runner and Dying Light have proven that parkour-based movement in general is looked upon favorably today, as it should be because it's awesome. So given all that, what should a modern Mirror's Edge follow-up look like, and why does it deserve one in the first place. If you took a quick peek at the first result on YouTube for Mirror's Edge walkthrough, something that I definitely didn't search up while I was playing the game, what are you talking about stuck? I didn't get stuck, shut up, you got stuck. You'll see that the first comment on there says, for a 2008 game, the graphics is very impressive, and yes, they is. But the reason for that isn't because DICE was all that ahead of the curve when it came to raw visuals, it's a byproduct of the game's art style and choice of colors. One that's kind of superseded the game itself in a way, despite not playing it until this very month, I was well aware of, and interested 
did in this style, and I definitely kind of wish that other games had employed it as well. Mirror's Edge's take on a dystopian society forgoes the dingy, rat-infested streets and zooms off in the opposite direction, creating a city so shiny and glossy that it looks like it applied Crest 3D white for 72 hours. It's a style that's really hard to recreate, and I think that's proven by the fact that the sequel looks a lot duller in my opinion. The first game takes it to such an extreme that you feel like you're perpetually in those little tutorial spaces that some games put you in, and it gives off the feeling that you're in a liminal space, breaking through the matrix as a runner, but in Catalyst that illusion is gone and it's just a very, very white city, and if I wanted to go to a white city, I'd just visit San Antonio. The bold colors placed against the flat, bright walls and floors offer up such a unique visual experience that doesn't overstay its welcome, another issue with Catalyst. The magic was kinda lost when I did so much backtracking and stayed in the same space for too long, but I wish that both games did better in using color as a guide. There's the option to turn on runner vision in both games, which makes doors, railings, and multiple objects red to indicate that you can use them to continue, except the times where it lights up red, but it's actually leading you to dead ends, thanks game. But I wish that the level design was a bit more intuitive in order to not rely on that vision as much. The stark contrast of the in-game colors provides such a good opportunity for more subtle cues on where to go to be incorporated, to kind of counter the fact that the game can't really use lighting to guide you places because everything's meant to be an equal amount of bright. But neither game uses that advantage all that much, and without it, I was really taken out of some sequences because I'd be getting chased at and shot in an open area and would just move and hop around looking for a path ahead, constantly respawning and losing the feeling of the chase entirely, only to find that the way forward was for some reason over this little fence that the game doesn't even guide you towards, and I wouldn't have even assumed it was the exit if it weren't for the red door with runner vision on. If the franchise does return in some capacity, I'd really want the art style to harken back to the original, with some extra thought being given to how it can function as a guide through the world without essentially being a big red arrow that points to stuff. Speaking of the style of the original also, I don't know if it's just me, but it bummed me out to see that the occasionally animated cutscenes from 1 were ditched for the photorealistic cutscenes in Catalyst. A creative choice that lowers the creativity? No thanks. I will say, the animated stuff from 1 was kinda poorly done. It featured a crazy 2D, 3D hybrid that played out in almost the reverse of most games like that, where the characters felt flat in a 3D space, but not all the way flat. I, I don't know, there was something weird and uncomfortable about it, and it led to some really funky looking scenes. But I wish it was improved on instead of just ditched, because a lot of games at this time were doing these more comic-y, animated styles for their cutscenes, and I want to see more of that nowadays. But I mean, the stories are really not the strong suits of these games anyways, they're really generic and sometimes poorly performed. Still, I at least want it to look like they tried, you know? Why us? We're no threat. Classic warfare. <laughs> Sorry, love, this is just classic warfare, out of my hands. Going back to that issue I mentioned previously, though, of not really knowing where to go at times, I think that's definitely my biggest problem with the first game, which is funny because just how easy it became to navigate levels is one of my least favorite things about the second game, and I would hope if we get another, we enter into a third bear's bowl of porridge situation where they get this just right. I was under the false impression that Mirror's Edge was a game that was in go mode 100% of the time, it was just run, run, jump, slide, run, forever, that's the whole game, so it surprised when it would often actually slow down and let me analyze my surroundings for a path forward. A lot of the time this was fun, if a bit of an adjustment because I had an itchy running finger, but the balance between the faster and slower movements was definitely warranted. I liked slow climbs through clever levels that made it feel like I was finding solutions to a problem even though the game is largely linear in how you can progress, but what I didn't like was being held up on chase scenes because the way forward wasn't something that you could always tell on the fly. It really removed the excitement of a chase when I started blundering around like an idiot and constantly dying, ruining the inertia but on the flip side, Catalyst level design makes me feel like I was just going through the motions and nothing exciting was happening. The games sometimes do a good job funneling you into where you need to go through enemy placement, a really good example being this one where I immediately recognize making a sharp right is the correct move, and when you know it, this clip ends right here, like this. I definitely didn't fall off the edge like a massive idiot, don't know why you'd think that, I just thought this was a good time to end the clip is all. But sometimes, it really fails to do so, like that earlier example I gave of the door past the fence, or this section where it's unclear which way you're supposed to go and I went right and started getting shot at a little, but not enough to make me think that I was going the wrong way, and then I died and I was like, okay, let me try the other way, and it worked, which is like, hey, this wasn't the worst experience of my life or anything, but it really made the set piece feel duller, I wish it was better communicated. The worst examples gotta be this though, where I went around for a while in loops, thoroughly confused and constantly biting the bullet until I realized that for some reason the way forward was this tiny little ledge tucked away in a corner that didn't stand out at all. You can literally see me finding this and looking around after like, Bro, really? 
that was so dumb. It was stages at that point and onward that started feeling like the combat was necessary to either take actual stock of how you can move forward or because you'd be riddled with bullets on your exit attempts. Even though the idea of being just a runner was so much more appealing to me, especially because the combat, was kind of stinky. I don't know if certain sections actually 100% required combat, but running into doors that you had to wheel open or needing to call elevators that took seven years to arrive while getting shot at kind of gave the impression that it was, and I wish it was more viable to use your parkour skills to escape every area if you chose to do so. Through all of this though, is the core free running stuff that provides a real sense of freedom and excitement when it's on its A game. Even small maneuvers like wall running, turning, and then grabbing onto a ledge felt great, and when I replayed the first game with more knowledge under my belt, it was fun being able to navigate escape routes with actual speed. I think some animations could certainly have been tweaked to make everything flow better, and both the base running speed as well as the slide feel a little bit too slow, but I chalked that up mainly to the game's aid since both things were improved in Catalyst, a game that also introduced a way to kickstart your running speed a bit more and turn corners quickly among other nice additions. If only it wasn't open world and didn't focus on the obscenely boring combat. I know with all of these complaints it sounds like I didn't actually like these games all that much, even the first one which I'm warmer on than the second, but I bring up these issues more to talk about how the problems could be ironed out if the series got a second shot, considering the underlying elements of these games, especially one, are really fun and addictive. Catalyst definitely proved that the running was able to feel smooth and chases could feel like actual escapes, and the OG game proved that the levels could be complicated and fun to navigate even with a limited moveset, so the elements for a more well-rounded title are certainly there, but neither one was able to capture its full potential in my opinion. Still, there's a charm, style, and feeling to Mirror's Edge that allowed it to capture my interest from the jump and blaze through its short campaign in a day despite elements being outdated. The game also has a sizable fan base, and other games have pushed the 3D parkour genre forward plenty since its release. And it feels like EA and DICE are both in a position where a game like this is more viable and possible than it has been in recent years. Mirror's Edge is, above all else, a unique game that felt like it had more left to give, especially since the sequel didn't really cash in on the right ideas of the first. And even though it features a lot of wonky combat, some less than stellar moments, and a slight underutilization of its style, if a new game in this franchise was ever announced, I'd not only be glad, but also really optimistic because there truly is something great here. Oh snap, how's she gonna get out of this one? There's no way she can- Okay, wait, uh, the two men with assault rifles are just missing her as she runs in front of- Wait, that guy's got an assault rifle in front of her to- uh, Hold, okay, I don't know how- but We won. We, we, uh, but the helicopter's going down, which is a big problem- uh, Never mind, we just hop out. Alright, good save. But now we gotta deal with the people that were shooting at us on the helipad. We, we gotta g go- Guys, no, there's- Wait, what the hell is happening? Why are you why are you hugging and playing pop music? Is is the game over? What ha what happened to the people that were shooting at you two seconds ago? Did we really just go from three assault rifles aimed at you and a runaway helicopter to the credits in under 60 seconds? What what just, bro? Imagine putting time into something like that and having it just end that abruptly.